Assalamu alaikum dear participants. Welcome to this session of uh, Mizan lecture series. As you all know, this lecture series is uh, basically an explanation of Ustaz Javed Ahmad Ghamadi's book Mizan, which actually is his understanding of the contents of Islam. So, because of the fact that the book was written in the Urdu language, uh, this series is an attempt to explain his view in the English language for the benefit of the English audience. Uh, we have been studying various chapters of this book. Uh, the chapter which is under discussion relates to the penal law, which means the Islamic punishments prescribed by the Quran. We have discussed uh, some of the punishments at length. Uh, so, uh, before I go, uh, go ahead with today's session, let me just uh, put the whole uh, session in perspective. Uh, so, the first thing that has to be understood is that as far as the penal law of Islam is concerned, as far as the directives are concerned, all of them relate to the state. So, none of these directives have any individual uh, import, as so to speak. In other words, Islamic punishments have to be administered in all circumstances by state authorities. No person can take the law in his or her hands and administer these punishments. Just as uh, war or jihad is uh, something which relates to the state authorities, similarly, these punishments also relate to state authorities. The second important thing which is also uh, noteworthy is that these punishments are primarily or we can say they are meant for Muslims only. Because these punishments are not only punishment for the crime that has been committed, but at the same time they are punishments for violating the covenant uh, with, in which a person enters when he uh, becomes a Muslim. So, and that is precisely why these punishments are very severe. So, therefore, we have to understand that as far as these punishments are concerned, they are primarily meant for Muslims. And uh, as far as uh, the crimes are concerned, in which non-Muslims are involved, so on all such instances, uh, the basis of agreement which has been made with them will be invoked and then these punishments will be legislated. So, as the third important thing uh, which uh, we have to understand as far as these penal uh, directives are concerned that uh, Islam has punished or given these punishments or, uh, for just five crimes. So basically five crimes are the ones for which Islam has prescribed punishments and has left the punishment of all other crimes except polytheism, apostasy and disbelief. These are the three exceptional punishments which God says that people who are guilty of polytheism, people who are guilty of uh, disbelief or kufr, polytheism of course is shirk, and people who are guilty of apostasy. These are the punishments which God says that he only has the prerogative to give. He gave them in the times of his messengers and they gave them on his behalf and he'll give them in the hereafter. But in the post prophetic era, these punishments are not applicable. But the ones that have are applicable are, are basically of five crimes. So one of them is uh, creating a law in order situation, creating nuisance and anarchy in the land which is called Muharba or Fasad Fil Ard. So, this is one crime for which uh, punishments have been prescribed. The second is murder, which of course includes intentional and unintentional murder. We have already studied the directives of intentional murder in our previous session, and today we will study the directives of unintentional murder. Then we have the punishment, the third punishment is of fornication. The fourth one uh, the fourth punishment relates to a kazf, which also is basically uh, accusing someone of fornication. And the fifth and final punishment is that of theft. So, except these five punishments, all other crimes for which a person is guilty of, they can be legislated. And the exception is that the death penalty or the death punishment or the capital punishment can only be given in two instances. One, if a person murders the other person. And second, if he is guilty of anarchy and disorder, spreading of anarchy and disorder in the land. Other than that, there is no other crime for which the death penalty can be given. So, with this background, we have to understand that as far as the Quran is concerned, this is all vis-a-vis uh, -vis the punishments it has prescribed. So, neither has it prescribed any punishment for polytheism, apostasy and disbelief uh, for common Muslims. These were prescribed by God for certain criminals in the era of God's messengers. 
and he is going to administer these punishments again in the hereafter. And the second important thing is that there are certain other punishments which have been made part of the Islamic, uh, Islamic Penal Code, which of course are not sanctioned by the Islamic Penal Code. One example of that is the jail punishment, because primarily jail punishment is a punishment in which what we do is we just don't punish the criminal himself or herself. It is the family who suffers. And there are other uh, uh, other very important and serious reservations also about the jail punishment and that is precisely why in the times of the Prophet this was never given. It is a much later introduction in the Islamic Penal Code and it is something uh, which is more barbarous than many other punishments. So therefore this, is, this has been left out of the Islamic uh, Penal Code by the Almighty himself. Now connecting our uh, talk and, and our session back to the previous session. So in our previous session we had started off to discuss the punishment of murder and we had completed the punishments of intentional murder because we all know that murder is of two types. One is that you have the intent to kill someone and the second type of murder is unintentional, something happens without intent. So today we will be taking up the punishments of unintentional murder and see how they have been described in the Quran and later on, if time permits, we will also take up the punishment of fornication. So now let us uh, turn to the Quran and see how this punishment has been prescribed uh, in the text of the Quran. And uh, if we look at the text of the Quran, this is basically Surah number 4, Surah Nisa and verse 92 in which this punishment has been set out. I am just going to read the text in translation. It says, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ أَنْ يَقْتُلَ مُؤْمِنًا إِلَّا خَطَأَ وَمَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا خَطَأً فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقْبَةِ مُؤْمِنَةٍ وَدِيَةٌ مُسَلَّمَةٌ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ إِلَّا أَنْ يَسَّدَّقُوا فَإِنْ كَانَ مِنْ قَوْمٍ عَدُوٍّ لَكُمْ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقْبَةِ مُؤْمِنَةٍ وَإِنْ كَانَ مِنْ قَوْمٍ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَهُمْ مِيثَاقٌ فَدِيَةٌ مُسَلَّمَةٌ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ وَتَحْرِيرُ رَقْبَةٍ مُؤْمِنَةٍ فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ شَهْرَيْنِ مُتَتَابِعَيْنِ تَوْبَةً مِنَ اللَّهِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا And it is unlawful for a believer to kill a believer except if it happens by accident. And he who kills a believer accidentally must free one Muslim slave and pay thee to the heirs of the victim except if they forgive him. If the victim is a Muslim belonging to a people at enmity with you, the freeing of a Muslim slave is enough. But if the victim belongs to an ally, the it shall have to be given to his heirs and a Muslim slave shall also have to be set free. He who does not have a slave must fast two consecutive months. This is from Allah a way to repent from this sin and he is wise all knowing. So viewers uh, described in this verse is the punishment of uh, unintentional murder in which you don't have any intent and uh, of course uh, you accidentally end up killing someone. And we see that uh, the various uh, clauses in which this law can be divided are, are basically three. And Ustaz uh, Ghamidi has laid them out one by one. I'm just going to read them the way he has described them. So firstly, if the murdered person is a Muslim citizen of his country or if he is not a Muslim but belongs to a nation with which a treaty has been concluded, it is necessary for the murderer who has not been forgiven to pay thee to atone for his sin and rep uh, repent before the Almighty and free a Muslim slave as well. So uh, the first thing that we have to understand here is uh, I have discussed some of this uh, part earlier also when we were discussing intentional murder that diyat primarily is a penalty which is imposed on the, uh, on the person who is guilty of murder uh, if he is forgiven. And in the case of unintentional murder, if he is forgiven, then uh, as it has been said here, that uh, if a person is not been forgiven and that person is a Muslim citizen of, of his country or if he is not a Muslim but he belongs to a nation with which a treaty has been concluded. So any of these cases, if this is the case, and if the, if the murderer has not been forgiven, then in such a situation, he will have to pay there and also repent before the Almighty, which is a given, and free a Muslim slave. As far as the is concerned, we've discussed this earlier on that this primarily is a penalty. And the Quran says that diyatun musallamatun ila alihi, and the words which the Quran uses are that the, the person who is to be forgiven 
uh, if he has been forgiven, then the, the way the diyat would be paid is fattibaw uh, bil maruf that the convention of the society will be followed in this regard, which means that the diyat the of a person has not been prescribed by the Sharia in any way. It has been left to the custom of a society. This custom can change. It can be different in different countries in the same period of time. But as far as uh, legislation is concerned, in the absence of any custom, even a parliament can come forward and legis legislate the amount of diyat. But it shall be based on the custom or tradition of the society. In the times of the Prophet, in fact, in his, uh, before his time arrived, the diyat was set at 100 camels and it was the Arab tradition uh, that he followed. So later on, people can adhere to this uh, custom, they can change it and they can legislate in, uh, afresh in, in case of this diyat. But one thing is absolutely certain that this diyat has not been prescribed in any way uh, by the Quran. The Quran has left this matter to the custom of the society, the conventions of a society, which means the maruf, and that can change from time to time, from society to society. So today, as I said, if there is no maruf, if there is no convention which exists in favor of diyat, then the parliament of a country can legislate this amount. So uh, this is one thing that has to be understood. The second thing is that in such a case that if a murder person is a Muslim citizen and he he may not be a Muslim but belongs to a nation with which there has been a treaty, then in such a case the Quran says if the murder has not been forgiven then death has to be paid and a Muslim slave has also to be set free. So slavery we all know was something which was part of the pre Islamic Arab society and Islam inherited this institution of slavery. In fact, it set about to, to emancipate slaves because of the fact that these slaves and their slavery was deeply rooted in the Arab society as a custom. So an immediate order of setting all slaves free was not given. It was uh, done in a gradual way. Today, of course, it has been totally eradicated. So. In place of that, our jurists have given this uh, excellent ishtahad to us that uh, if a person who is in the form, he needs to pay some penalty maybe or he needs a bail to set himself free. So we can uh, analogously uh, regard such people to be, uh, to be uh, done in lieu of setting a uh, slave free. So this is the first institute as far as uh, the institutes or the law of unintentional murder is concerned. The second one is that if the murdered person is a Muslim and belongs to an enemy country, if the murdered person is a Muslim and belongs to an enemy country, the murderer is not required to pay diyat. In this case, it is enough that he only free a Muslim slave. So what has happened here is that the slave has to be still set free if the murdered person belongs to an enemy country and he is also a Muslim. Now the third is in both these cases if the criminal does not have a slave he should consecutively fast for two months. So this has also been mentioned that in the absence of having a slave then the person who is guilty of murder he must fast two consecutive months which is 60 days of fasting. So this is or in case uh, we know that these are the three statutes on which the law of uh, uh, unintentional murder has been based. As I said, unintentional murder does not mean that we are in any way uh, charged with this murder if it is not our fault at all. And that would not be counted as unintentional uh, uh, murder. For example, if you are driving the car carefully and a person himself throws himself uh, before the car or, or the vehicle which is moving. Uh, then this cannot be regarded as, a, as unintentional murder because it was not done with any intent uh, or lack of intent in this case uh, by the person who was driving the car. That person appeared out of nowhere and he just rammed himself. Maybe he was doing, trying to do suicide or he might have been uh, wrongly assessing to cross the road. So in such a case, the assessment uh, must be done very fairly that there has to be some, some uh, form of accident on the part of the person who is guilty, that has to be understood. In the absence of that, the, we will we, we'll not say that uh, any intention, uh, unintentional murder has, to, has taken place. So, uh, and also, as we have also seen, that uh, the Quran tells us that uh, these directives, of course, pertain to unintentional murder. But 
it is obvious that the directive of unintentionally wounding someone because you are not uh, always you end up uh, killing someone accidentally it can also be possible that you injure someone so that would be no different so in this case diet shall have to be paid and fast shall have to be kept considering the amount of diet paid for example if the diet of a certain type of wound is fixed at let's say one third of the diet of the murder one third of the amount of the diet of the murder then one third of 60 is 20 so 20 fast as atonement shall have to be kept so this is just to give an idea of the fact that at times uh, it's uh, equally important to realize that you are not killing someone, you have not killed someone, but you have wounded and injured someone unintentionally. So unintentionally injuring and wounding someone also ha has uh, this penalty. Also important in these directives of uh, intentional and uh, unintentional murder, as I have already said, is that the word uh, diet must be understood. Uh, I mean, in, in Surah Nisa, we know that the words used are diyatum musallamatun ila ahlihid, and the word diyat has occurred as a common, common noun. So, as already explained, if there was a very prescribed amount of diyat, the, diyat, the way the diyat has been mentioned here will not be in the form of a common noun. So, it is basically, uh, it occurs as a common noun because, as I said, its customary usage has to be trusted. So, nothing other than this is required. So anything which means uh, custom, I mean uh, in our custom means diet will be implied by this. Uh, in verse uh, 178 of Surah Bakra, we studied this uh, earlier on. We know that the words were that uh, which means that if there has been some remission from the brother, then this remission has to be followed uh, according to the maruf. Fattibaum bil maruf. So this clearly tells us that it is the maruf that has to be followed, which I just explained. Now, we also must understand that as far as these verses of Surah Nisa and, uh, and Surah, uh, in Surah Nisa and Surah Bakra are concerned, in the case of intentional and unintentional murder, the, the Quran has stipulated this that the traditions of the society has to be they have to be honored. So, in this regard we cannot discriminate between a man or a woman or a slave or a free man or a Muslim or a non-Muslim. So this is something which is uh, unimaginable. The Prophet decided all the cases of Diyat according to the customs and traditions of the Arabian society during his own times. And in his own times we know that there was this tradition of Aqila or the custom of Aqila. Aqila would uh, refer to a tribe who would be responsible for any such penalty that was to be given for a crime perpetrated by the member of that tribe. So basically it was on behalf of uh, that Aqila that this would be done. But we know that today this tribal system has no longer, it, it no longer exists, social conditions and cultural traditions, they have all changed so much and uh, uh, therefore we have to understand that the nature of Aqila, which is community or tribe has totally changed. And we cannot uh, uh, legislate on the basis of Aqila, uh, which existed in the times of the Prophet. So in this regard, we have to follow the custom and, or the maruf, as the Quran has said. And every society is to obey its custom. And, and because in our, in our own society, for example, in our own Pakistani society, no law exists about diet previously. I mean, it's something that has, been to, has to be legislated. So people who are at the helm of the affairs, they can re-legislate. So they don't have to follow the... Arab custom of a hundred camels, which was the time uh, in the times of the Prophet. So it it would be wrong to do so unless, of course, that is that is willingly adopted, considering it to be the maruf of, today, of today's society. But considering it to be the maruf of the Prophet society and thinking that it is essential to follow his maruf, that would be an erroneous conclusion. So we must keep this in mind that as far as this is concerned, it has to be based on the maruf or the custom of our own society. Viewers, now let's move on uh, to the third punishment which has been mentioned in the Quran. I'm just going to read out the text of uh, that punishment also. So we are going to uh, discuss the punishment of fornication. So fornication and adultery, uh, both of course are terms used in the English language. Fornication implied uh, is, implies this uh, in which uh, out of wedlock relations take place between two unmarried people and adultery implies that one of them is married uh, or at times both of them. So we are not making any distinction here when we are describing uh, this punishment. So regardless of uh, the state of the criminal uh, who perpet perpetrates this crime, whether he is married or not married, because this is something which the Quran is not in any way distinguished. So 
uh, we will discuss this punishment. So let me first read out the text of uh, this punishment before you. This is mentioned in Surah Nur, which is the 24th Surah of the Quran, verses 2 and 3. So the words are Azaniyatu Wazani Fajlidu Kulla Wahidim Minhuma Miata Jalda. Wala Takhuz Wala Takhuz Takhuzu Bikum Takhuz Kum Bihima Rafatun Fi Din in Lahi in Kuntum Tukminuna Bilahi Wal Yomil Akhir. Wal Yeshad Azaba Huma Taifatum Minal Mukminin Azani La Yan Kehu Illa Zania, O Mushrika. Wazaniyatu La Yan Kehuha Illa Zanin, O Mushrik. Wahurima Zalika Alal Mukminin. The man and the woman guilty of fornication flog each of them with a hundred stripes and let not compassion move you in their case in the enforcement of the law of God if you truly believe in God in the last day and let a party of the believers witness their punishment. The man guilty of fornication may only marry a woman similarly guilty or an idolatress and the woman guilty of fornication may only marry such a man or an idolater. The believers are forbidden such marriages. So in a nutshell we can see that as far as the Quran is concerned it has clearly said that in this regard we have to understand that people who are guilty of this heinous uh, crime they have to be punished in this way. But the initial directive in this regard uh, regarding the punishment of fornication is mentioned in Surah, uh, in Surah Nisa actually and no definite punishment is mentioned there it is only said that until some directive is revealed about women who as prostitutes habitually commit fornication, they should be confined to their homes and the common perpetrators of this crime should be chastised until they repent and mend their ways. And this chastisement may range from exhorting and reprimanding, scolding and censuring, humiliating and disgracing the criminal to beating, up, uh, beating him up for the purpose of uh, reforming him. So this initial uh, punishment of uh, fornication we know has been mentioned in Surah Nisa before this final punishment which I just read out uh, being given in Surah Nur. So uh, let us take a look at how it was mentioned earlier in Surah Nisa in which a temporary directive was given as I just said that peop uh, the prostitutes were about them it was said that who, who habitually commit fornication they should be confined uh, to their homes and about the common perpetrators of this crime it was said that they should be chastised and, uh, in, and, and given various uh, bodily reprimands uh, in various ways. So uh, this is how it has been mentioned in the Quran. وَاللَّذَانِ يَأْتِيَانِهَا مِنْكُمْ فَآَزُوهُمَا فَإِن تَابَ وَأَصْلَهَا فَأَعْرِذُوا أَنْهُمَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ تَوَّابَ الرَّحِيمَا And upon those of your women who commit fornication, call in four people among yourselves to testify over them. If they testify to their ill ways, confine them to their homes till death overtakes them or God formulates another way for them. And the man and woman guilty among you who commit fornication, chastise them. So this is the common punishment. Previously we have seen the first part of the verse mentions prostitutes and the second part mentions common uh, perpetrators of this crime. About them it is said and the men and man and woman uh, among you who commit fornication chastise them. If they repent and mend their ways leave them alone for God is ever forgiving and most merciful. So we can see that as far as uh, uh, the Quran is concerned the, after this uh, initial directive this final directive was given in Surah Nur. Now this punishment of fornication uh, before the def definite directive was revealed in Surah Nur, uh, we know that uh, this is, was a temporary, uh, it was like a temporary uh, form of reprimand. However, once this verse of Surah Nur was, re was revealed, it actually abrogated the previous directive permanently. So remember the previous directive was a temporary one for prostitutes and for common criminals of fornication. But this is something which overrides that directive. Now the directives ex uh, which are mentioned in these verses can be explained thus and I'm just going to read out from Ustaz Ghamidi's Mizan so that you are also able to follow the way he has uh, laid out this whole law. So he's written that the man or woman who have committed fornication both shall receive a hundred stripes according to the methodology adopted by the Prophet and the rightly guided caliphs 
And according to case precedents reported in our books of Hadith and Fiqh in this regard, now he has uh, given some details about this, uh, the nature of this uh, punishment, the way it has been uh, discussed and described in Hadith and our books of Fiqh. So, the first of them is that whether a cane is used to flog a criminal or a lash in both cases, it should neither be very thick and hard nor very thin and soft, which of course means that uh, it should be in a way, it should, be, it should not be something which leaves a mark on the skin of the person who is to be lashed. The second important thing is that the criminal should not be beaten bare-bodied or while tied to a tripod. Now, this is something that we will find in many Muslim countries that they lash criminals, they flog them by tying them to a tripod, which is of course not uh, what has been prescribed. And uh, the other important thing is that he should not be beaten bare-bodied. He can wear his clothes because this is not the purpose uh, as, we, we, as we very well know. The third important thing is that the criminal should not be flogged in a manner that wounds him, nor should he be flogged on one part of the body. The flogging should be made to spread all over the body except for his face and private parts. This again shows that this is a case of reprimand. It is not a case of cruelly uh, injuring or wounding a person. The fourth thing which is mentioned is that a pregnant woman should be flogged only after she has given birth and the period of pupil discharge has passed. So if you have to flog a woman who is guilty of fornication, then this concession has to be given as well. So this was the first thing. The second thing which Ustaz has written is that the criminal should be given this punishment publicly to humiliate him in front of the people and to make him a lesson for those present. The worst directs the government or the court of justice to show no lenience in this regard. This harsh treatment given to the criminal is essential because the stability of a society relies on the sanctity of the relationships in the family and on their protection from every type of disorder. So remember when we were studying this punishment, the Quran has said that a group of believers, well, yashhad ta'ifa, uh, the group of deliver, uh, believers must witness this punishment. And that is why about the punishment of fornication, it is essential that it should be given publicly to not only humiliate the criminals for what they have done, and at the same time, it should act as a deterrent for all, all other people. When something is given publicly, it, it really uh, sets up a standard and it really is very exemplary in this regard and it becomes ex extremely hard on the people who might be thinking of this uh, violation. Thirdly, uh, uh, Ustaz Ghamadi writes that after this punish punishment has been carried out, so remember these uh, statutes that he is describing uh, are not on his own, based on his own, uh, but basically they are his interpretation of what the Quran has already said. So the first thing that the nature of the of flogging should be such that it should not wound or injure a person or uh, make him bare bodied, of course, something which is uh, we can understand uh, directly from the verses. Secondly, also, as far as the Quran is concerned, that uh, it is the Quran itself who has directed that a group of people should witness this flogging so that it becomes a publicly known thing. And thirdly, the Quran itself has said that no chaste woman or man should marry men and women who commit fornication. So according to the Quran, such people can only marry among their own sort or among the idolaters. It does not allow the marriage of a pious man with a, with a man, of a pious woman with a man guilty of committing fornication, nor does it permit a pious man to bring home such a woman in his house. So by this, Ustaz actually means that a person who has been publicly uh, found guilty and punished for this crime, he, or he becomes a declared fornicator. For such a person, he does not have the liberty for the rest of his life to marry a pious person or a pious lady. He has to marry amongst his own sort. And this is part of the punishment. So this is part of the punishment. It's not just the fact that it's a recommendation. It is part of the punishment. That if you have been declared guilty and you have been punished as a fornicator, then your marriage can not take place with a pious woman. You can only marry amongst your own sort, which means that women who have been publicly declared guilty for this crime, and similarly men who have been publicly declared guilty, of course, by the court of law, only they can marry one another, which of course, as I said, is part of the crime. And again, this is, uh, this is based on the Quranic words, which means that they, uh, this, such marriage is absolutely prohibited to, to the believers. 
The fourth thing which Ustaz has mentioned, I'm all, I'll also mention that, and that is while stating this punishment, adjectives are used to qualify the men and women who commit fornication. This is similar to the statement in which the punishment for theft is mentioned. It is evident, therefore, that this punishment is the utmost punishment which should be given only when the crime has been committed in its ultimate form and the criminal does not deserve any lenience as far as the circumstances of the crime are concerned. So, uh, by this, Ustaz actually means it has not been said that a person who is guilty of fornication, so the, the verb has not been used. What has been used is are actually uh, adjectives or attributes. Azani is an adjective. And similarly, azania is also an adjective. So, had this been, not been the case and uh, it would have been something different and verbs would have been used, then it would have been an entirely different matter. So, this means that uh, an attribute, something becomes an attribute of a person, it means that it becomes part of his personality. So, a, a person can only be called azani when it becomes, when fornication becomes a part of his personality. Not just one single instance of committing a an act of fornication can make him a zani. So a word a zani means a person who is now, he, he, he can be called by this name because it has become his habit or it's something that you can find in him. So therefore in this regard we have to understand that we must not think that as far as uh, this punishment is concerned, uh, then uh, this punishment cannot in any way warrant any lenience uh, except as I said if there is to be some sort of uh, lenience to be given. And we must also understand that uh, this punishment has been committed in its ultimate form and only then this uh, ultimate punishment has to be given. So what does this mean actually? It actually means that criminals who are foolish, insane, have been compelled by circumstances are without the necessary protection required to abstain from committing a crime or cannot bear the punishment are all exempt from this punishment. So, to give you an example uh, about women who, whom their masters would force to take to prostitution, the Quran says, and let me quote that verse, وَمَنْ يُكْرِهُنَّ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِكْرَاهِهِنَّ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمِ And if anyone compels them, Allah will be forgiving and merciful to them after their being compelled to it. Which, in other words, means that if women who in the times of the Prophet, they were slave women who were forced to be prostitutes, the Quran did not tell them to run away from their masters. They did not say that they have to uh, just abstain. No, they said that this is something which they have been compelled to. So now if their masters have compelled them to this thing, then as the verse says, uh, Because of this compulsion that they are being, that they are being made to go undergo, God, you'll find that God is very merciful to them. Let me give you another example also which is cited by Ustaz Ghamidi in his book. He says that slave women who were present in the Prophet's times, they also cannot be administered this punishment because of their improper upbringing and education and because of a lack of family protection. So much so if their husbands and masters have done all they can to keep them chaste, have done all they can to keep them chaste and in spite of this they commit the crime, they shall only be given half the punishment which means 50 lashes. So this shows that the, the crime of fornication that has been mentioned in the Quran is the extreme form in which a, punish, punish, a person has, uh, he deserves no lenience. In this case, which I have just described before you, that uh, if uh, these slave women have been kept chaste and in spite of that they commit fornication, then the Quran says only 50 lashes would be given to them. And for this, let me also cite the words. The Quran says, فَإِذَا أُحْسِنَّ فَإِنْ أَثَيْنَا بِفَاحِشَةٍ فَعَلَيْهِنَّ نِسْفُ مَا عَلَى الْمُحْسَنَاتِ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ Then they are, then when they are kept chaste in this manner and they commit fornication, their punishment is half that of free women. So viewers, this brings us to an end to our discussion on the issue of fornication also. And this also would uh, be an eye-opener for many people who would think that maybe uh, the punishment of adultery or fornication are different, which means between married and unmarried couple, that is not so. And at the same time, you will also see that there is absolutely no need for four witnesses in the case of the punishment of, uh, of, of, of fornication. This is something which has been erroneously inducted in the penal code. Once again, this is something which relates to erroneously accusing people of fornication. When you accuse some innocent person or a chaste person of this 
described in the Quran says that you have to bring four eyewitnesses. It does not say that you have to bring four eyewitnesses in the case of a normal uh, case of fornication. We will discuss that uh, inshallah in our next session when we, when we will study the punishment of Qazf and it will become absolutely clear. As far as fornication is concerned, uh, there is no stipulated uh, a number of witnesses that have been uh, prescribed by the Quran. It will stand proven uh, the way crimes stand proven through uh, DNA reports, through the testimony of the camera or any other footage that might become available or by the confession of the criminal or by any other circumstantial uh, evidence. So, uh, inshallah, we'll take up the issue of Qazf and theft and with that we'll be ending our uh, chapter on Islamic punishments and that will be inshallah next time. But for today, if you have any questions on what we have just studied, please raise them. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Aap khariyat se? Alhamdulillah. Mera sawaal ye tha ki ye sazayin Quran mein bayan hui hai. زنا کے لیے تو اس میں جو ہے فورس فل جو ہے وہ ریپ کے لیے اور جو ہے یہ سیم سیکس جو گے سیکس ہے اور جو لیزوین سیکس ہے ان کے لیے اسپیشلی کچھ بیان نہیں ہوئی ہے کہ انہیں بھی اسی کیٹیگری میں رکھا جائے گا ایز فار ایز ریپ از کنسرن وی آلریڈی ڈسکس دیٹ دیٹ از پنشمنٹ وچ واز مینشن ایٹ انڈر دی پنشمنٹ آف محاربہ اور فساد فل ارد And uh, we have seen that earlier on that uh, Muharba and Fasad Fil Ard have been uh, punishable by four broad punishments. So one of them is Taktil, which means that you can mercilessly kill that person. You can stone him to death, for example, if he deserves no lenience. You can crucify him. You can amputate his limbs from opposite sides. And if he deserves any lenience, you can exile him. So the, pers- the punishment of uh, Muharba or spreading anarchy in the land, which, is, which are mentioned in uh, verse 35 or 34 of Surah Maida, they are the ones which are applicable on the issue of rape, because in rape you are guilty of spreading disorder in the land and also creating a law and order situation. As far as the punishment of homosexuality is concerned, it has not been prescribed anywhere in the Quran and uh, it can be legislated uh, by, the, by, the, uh, Islam, by a court of, uh, or by a legislative body, which is of course the parliament. And, uh, but the, the Quran itself has not prescribed any such punishment. But this, this does not mean that a parliament cannot do so. The parliament has the authority to legislate uh, a punishment for homosexuality if it deems proper. I am continuing to continue. In Surah Maida, the ayat that has been given to the Lord, the Lord has been given to the Lord, the Lord has been given to the Lord, the Lord has been given to the Lord. تو وہ اسپیشلی جیسے یہاں تو آئے تھے کلیئر ہیں کہ یہ مسلمانوں کو خطاب کر کے کہیں گئی ہے تو وہاں سے ہم کیسے نکال سکتے ہیں وہ بات آئی مین دا وے دا قرآن از سائٹیڈ دیٹ مین اجل ذالک سی مین اجل ذالک اٹس کتب نہ مین اجل ذالک دا ورڈ کنیکٹنگ ورڈ از بیکاز آف دس بیکاز آف دس وچ ٹیلز اس دیٹ دیر از اے سملیرٹی of uh, intent and there is no there is a case of no revocation no abrogation and the way it has been mentioned it's it tells us that the quran has upheld the punishment of the torah so the punishment which is mentioned for the israelites for uh, for them it has been upheld for the muslims as well you can read from the context uh, which tells us and, and the word min ajli zalik tells us that اور اسی میں ہی ایک اور سوال یہ پیدا ہوا ہے کہ اسی میں جو بنی اسرائیل میں یہ سزا دی جاتی تھی جو اسٹون سے مار کی جو سزا ہے تو وہ وہاں سے یہاں پر لی گئی ہے ایسا ہے کیا کہ جو شادی شدہ زانی کے لیے لی گئی ہے وہاں سے تو ایسا وہاں تو رہتے This is an additional question which the, prof- the Prophet actually asked to see whether the person deserved any lenience or not. As far as uh, this punishment of stoning is concerned, this is basically mentioned in the Quran as, a, as, a, as an interpretation of the word taqtil. Taqtil means to kill someone in a very, very merciless way. One form of that taqtil is, is, is stoning to death. There could have been other forms as well. So as far as uh, the punishment of stoning is concerned, this is not directly mentioned in the Quran. The Quran just mentions the word taqtil. Taqtil is the real punishment. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Dr. Shahzad. Thank you, Naveed. If you have further questions, we may get back to you after we are done with the rest of the participants. Shiraz Ahmed, uh, you may unmute your mic and ask your questions. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Shahzad. 
Uh, Zadi, uh, you, as you mentioned, Quran clearly differentiates between uh, a certain group of people uh, whose upbringing was not as good. So the Quran already, you know, half their punishment. But mm -hmm. I have heard it for the past several years or decades that now the revelation is complete and we are not going to use that divine wisdom of the Quran. So if let's assume a group of people who have been a non-Muslim all their lives, right? If they become Muslim today, so and the next day, they, oh, they commit a, a, adultery, maybe habitually. Uh, they are, they're trying to, you know, start following the practices of uh, Islam, but we haven't given them enough time. So immediately we will uh, punish them with 100 lashes. I think uh, immediately we, we will not even report that punishment. So you see, uh, the Quran wants us to hide this punishment. We will see uh, that in, in our later a discussion when we discuss the punishment of Qazv, the Prophet himself said that, well, if a person is innocent in character or he's trying to be good and from him some act of uh, some such similar act emanates, then the Quran, the Quran has actually said or the Prophet has actually said that, uh, would that you have hidden this crime? So the, the way in which the Prophet has described this and the Quran also describes it, it actually tells us that a person who, who is like trying to reform himself or maybe is guilty of such one-off misconduct, then we should be hiding his, uh, his misconduct instead of reporting it. It is only people who have become worthy of being reported should be reported. So uh, the thing that we have to understand is that why should we even bring it to the notice of law when we in our, in our own senses, in our own uh, in our own discussion with that person can maybe make sense to him and make, make him realize what he is doing wrong. So remember, reporting this crime itself is something which the Quran discourages. Thank you, Shalbi. Uh, uh, I have a single line follow-up question, right? So let's talk about a hypothetical Muslim society uh, uh, who are at their worst, right? Uh, we know that they are Muslims, but they are not very religious. So when you and Javed and Gandhi Saab teach us Quran, you say that these punishments are the maximum punishments, right? So right. a judgment, so is it accurate to say that the judge may also need to take into account that, hey, we are just Muslims by birth, and maybe these people are not that worth, well worth with Islam, and putting the maximum punishment to them is going to just push them further away from Islam, right? So uh, uh, that's why you say that it's a maximum punishment that if the right. person does not Require any means. Absolutely, you're right about that. So a person who has maybe just started to practice Islam or maybe, as you said, have just converted and still not fully, uh, I mean, fully adverse, uh, conversant with the rules of Islam. Uh, so all these things will be taken into account by the judge. And uh, this is something which he will only administer to a person who is fully aware of what he has done and he deserves no lenience. I mean, this is the guideline that shall be given to the judge. That when you see that a person who is doing it willfully, knowingly, uh, out of having full protection, still swaying from uh, the, from righteousness when he knew that he could have abstained from uh, from that path. So you see, all these things uh, will be taken into consideration by the judge, and uh, and this guideline will be given to him that unless and until you find that there is absolutely no uh, circumstantial evidence or there is nothing that could give them any any uh, lenience should you prescribe these punishments. Otherwise, th th he can prescribe any other punishment which is lesser in form. For example, he can penalize them, he can uh, have them, uh, I mean, even uh, let's say lash with, with a very small number of lashes like five or six or seven if he's, he deems fit. He can uh, impose a penalty on them. So all these lesser forms of punishment, if he deems fit, can be given and he can even make them go free or scot free if they think that they are still not in the in, a, in the frame of mind or they have not been fully educated uh, and they should not be given any punishment so it, as i said it is all situational and this is what the quran teaches us and this also is not just a simple matter of uh, deduction it is basically a linguistic matter the the way the word azani is used it's like an adjective had it been allazi zana or or allati tazna that would have been how a verb has is normally used, which, which would mean that a person who commits a fornication once or twice. So verbs are always used when a person does uh, something once or twice or it's not become a habit of him. But an attribute is only used when it becomes the person's habit. So the word azani has been used just as the word asariq has been used for a person who is a thief. So linguistically also, 
we have to understand that this punishment cannot be ad administered until and unless that criminal does, deserves absolutely no lenience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shazan. There's a question in the chat. Um, you speak about death among Muslims. What about the situations in which either the murder or the murder, murder the one who is murdered is a non-Muslim? So as I said, in that case, uh, this, has, this, this law that we have studied today and the rest of it that we'll study inshallah next week, it relates to a Muslim uh, per se. As far as the punishments of non-Muslims are concerned, if they are guilty of murder or theft or fornication or kazaf, this says something in which a parliament can legislate and take their opinion and uh, then form, uh, I mean, uh, and then uh, give any form of punishment which as a result takes into consideration their viewpoint. So this is, this, these punishments which we have discussed today, they unilaterally concern only Muslims who have entered the covenant uh, with God of becoming Muslims. For others, it has to be legislated. Hi, thank you. So um, there's a question that I have, uh, and that is that in this, uh, in our society uh, and in the world, fornication or having a consensual physical intimacy is very common and it's not even considered wrong right so um and <clears throat> in but in islam we are encouraged i've uh, learned many times from you and javed and Ghamdi too that we are supposed to not uh you know tell the world about people's whatever people sins or whatever wrongdoings are doing right so what is what would be a scenario in which a person's act this act would uh, go so far that it will go to the court right. and then there will be a, a judgment done based on it. So what right. is it? You see, I understand. So you see when a person becomes a nuisance in the society, that it, uh, what he or she, uh, the both of them are doing, it affects the family in any way. It becomes uh, rampant and people are getting affected by it. Uh, the impact is very deep. Then, of course, uh, people can decide. And uh, remember that, that in this, such a case also, uh, the Quran says that if you have to if you have to accuse someone of this, then you have to bring four eyewitnesses. Otherwise, uh, I mean, what what except self confession would be the way in which a person will go and confess that? There would be no other way for the crime of uh, fornication to be reported. So basically, if you have to report someone, then it has to be on the basis of an accusation. Then then that in that accusation, you must see people doing that crime as an eyewitness which itself shows because it is not going to happen very easily or maybe it could, could be a very rare situation that actually Islam discourages this to happen. It does not want this to happen unless of course things go as far as the person becomes such a nuisance that he does such acts so openly that there are four eyewitnesses available uh, to witness what he is doing. This itself shows that such should be the extent of the uh, nature of his carelessness and indifference to Islamic law. So even though Allah has uh, told us in the Quran that this is one of the uh, biggest sins, He still wants us. He still wants people to reform because you see, look at the punishment. See, yeah, that's it. You see, the punishment is that once you are a convict, you have been convicted of fornication, your own uh, marriage would break. You would not no longer be married with the pious woman that you were married if, if you were married. And if you are to marry, then you will only marry amongst women or, who, or men who are similarly guilty of, uh, of uh, fornication and they have been convicted for that. So you see, this is uh, because the reputation is going to suffer for the rest of the life. You, uh, you will become a, a non-entity for the rest of your life, so to speak. So that is why the Quran says that it has laid very stringent rules to convict a person for this crime. It actually wants people to reform themselves, realize themselves that they are going doing something wrong. It wants elders of the society to interfere and tell them and educate them that this is something which is going to go worse. Uh, it should be it would be adverse to their own family. It would be something which is absolutely uh, killing for their children as well. So basically, it's that realization which the Quran wants that should happen. But if things get out of control, obviously uh, this is something which every person can do. But before that happens. The Quranic uh, directive is that uh, I mean this should be done uh, as I mean only when 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 a person has become so 
lecherous and so lustful that he is uh, that he does this in in such a careless way in 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 different way that you can find four witnesses uh, uh, i mean doing this uh, uh, witnessing him and uh, you are able to accuse him of fornication because you see no one is going to do with this in front of the uh, society it's only when a person becomes so lecherous that he does not care he is going to do it inside of his home or outside does he do, uh, do this crime in a way that uh, you have four eyewitnesses for him thank you dr shahzad uh, shiraz ahmed please ask your question uh, shahzad uh, this question is directly related to somebody who's very close to me in my personal life right a friend he only has one daughter and three sons and i consider her my daughter not just niece so a few months back he got engaged to somebody and they are filthy rich people i'm not going to name them but then they got proof that while that boy was in uk let's just say uh, his past was not very clean i'm talking in the context of fornication right now they called me to their home yesterday and they were discussing the scenario with me what shall parents do in such a situation because the cross argument is that hey a girl can never be sure about any guy uh, any guy can have a change of heart in the future right so yeah the risk is always there but in this particular situation what shall they be if you were the parent of if you were the father of that girl what would be your advice to that girl because at the end of the day it's her decision so you see it's difficult to give an advice without uh, complete data but personally i think i would leave the decision to my daughter and i would tell her that well if the person has clearly repented and he has come out of his uh, uh, evil habits and uh, if and he's otherwise a good person and uh, i mean he's willing to settle as a family person he's not going to have those extra marital relations anymore so i mean uh, uh, to give a, that person a fair chance but as i said this is something that can be a, just an advice from the father it's uh, maybe the the girl herself would not like to continue with such a person that's her personal choice so uh, as an advice of course we would say that once this has happened and the person has come clean and he has uh, totally given up so maybe he should be given that chance that would be i think an, an advice that most fathers would give but finally it's the it's the will of the daughter that should prevail okay okay thank you सर uh, मुझे पूछना था कि आपने भी बताया गांधी साहब डिस्करेज करते हैं जेल कैद करने की प्रिजन की पनिशमेंट को तो सर व्हाट आर द बाकी जो पनिशमेंट्स प्रेस्क्राइब की गई हैं वो एक्सट्रीम फॉर्म्स हैं तो वो क्योंकि सर एग्जाइल तो आजकल एक डिजायरेबल चीज है लोगों के लिए तो सर व्हाट काइंड ऑफ अदर पनिशमेंट कैन बी लेजिस्लेटेड फॉर माइनर क्राइम्स i mean uh, other punishments of course the biggest is penalty you can impose uh, some penalty monetary penalty you can give some physical penalty uh, you can uh, flog a person uh, maybe uh, 10 5 7 uh, uh, lashes uh, depending on the nature of the crime uh, you can ask him to do some some physical uh, thing which is uh, difficult for him to accomplish you can give him some errands so these are the things that we generally do Thank you, sir. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shahzad. There is a question from Sania. The fornicator should marry a fornicator or an idolater. What about a Muslim mm -hmm. woman fornicator? Can she marry an idolater? Referring to Surah Nur, Ayat three. Yeah. So that is what the Quran has actually said. That such is the heinous nature of this crime, that uh, once a person has been declared a convict, he can. either marry amongst his own sort or he uh, he or she can marry amongst idolaters which are people who of course uh, commit polytheism so in other words polytheism and fornication they are they are brought at par because you see when you commit fornication you are disloyal to your spouse and when you commit poly uh, i mean uh, when you commit poly, uh, polytheism you are disloyal to god so this is how the quran wants to express the extent of this disloyalty in the one case you are being disloyal to your spouse and in the other case you are being disloyal to god and that is why the quran has said that in such a case either you marry amongst your own so uh, i mean exactly people who have done what you have done or people who are guilty of idolatry so in other words uh, a convicted fornicator is does not matter to allah if he remains a muslim or not no that's not the case i mean that is part of his punishment so when he is going to marry 
uh, a po polytheist person, that's not going to turn him into a uh, non-Muslim. He still remains a Muslim. The only thing is that this is his punishment that he cannot marry a pious person in the society. He cannot marry someone who is introduced as a Muslim in the society. He can only marry an, a person who is similarly guilty of the crime that he or she has committed or someone who is uh, an idolatrous or an idolater. Thank you. Shiraz, if you still want to ask your question. Oh, thank you. Uh, Shahzad, today's verse ex uh, of the Quran about uh, accidental death explicitly talk about a Muslim accidentally killing another Muslim. What about if a Muslim accidentally kills a non-Muslim, right? An accident happened, the other person can be an atheist. In that right. case, are we supposed to do ishtihad, means the parliament? Of will course, yes. I have just described that all these punishments which are uh, mentioned in the Quran, they are meant specifically for Muslims. Uh, any non-Muslim guilty of perpetrating the same crime, in that case, a legislation has to be done by the parliament. And of course, the opinion of those people who are non-Muslims will be taken and then the parliament will legislate. So in such a case, it's may, maybe the non-Muslims, they adopt the same punishment as the Quran has prescribed. Maybe they uh, opt for the same punishment and maybe they don't. But the final decision will be, will be with the parliament. But the consent of these non-Muslims be, shall be taken uh, when this law is being formed. But what is absolutely certain is that the, these five punishments have been specifically prescribed for Muslims. For non-Muslims, it shall be a new legislation done with their consent. And same is true. Thank you. You already said it, so Thank sorry. But same is true for fornication as well, right? So if a Muslim yes, and a non-Muslim yes, commits yes, fornication, yes. all five, all five, whether it's uh, theft, whether it's fornication, whether it's kazf, whether it's murder, and whether it's uh, haraba. डॉक्टर साहब मैं जानना चाह रहा था कि अभी आपने बताया था लेकिन मैं क्लियर नहीं हो पाया कि कोई शादीशुदा मर्द या औरत अगर जिना के मृत्यु की हो जाते हैं तो उनका रिश्ता बाकी रहेगा कि खत्म हो जाएगा आई मीन आइदर ऑफ देम और बोथ ऑफ देम आई मीन आई मीन व्हाट आई व्हाट आई एम सेइंग इज इफ दे आर नॉट कन्विक्टेड इफ देयर देयर मैटर हैज नॉट बिकम हैज नॉट बीन टेकन टू द कोर्ट एंड द कोर्ट इज नॉट कन्विक्टेड देम their their uh, marriage will still stay intact and as i said in that case the quran wants us to hide the punishment or the crime of such a person their marriage will only break when they are convicted of this punishment by a court of law 